today we're going to talk about orders of architecture and what they mean to masons and what some of the just the different characteristics about architecture and order in architecture are and how a group of guys who come from all different walks of life why they're sitting around talking about architecture so we'll talk about yeah you know, why we're interested in orders of architecture uh, where they originated from, what the different orders are. We have them split into to aggression, so from Greece and Roman orders of architecture, and then fo um, following up what they mean to Masons. And here's a, a really nice um, picture. There's a lot of really interesting art available when it comes to orders of architecture because they're you figure they're already pleasing to the eye as buildings, so to be able to see them um, also showing up kind of in, in a line is, is also pretty nice to be able to see. So why architecture? And all Masonic rituals for the three degrees, we use architectural tools and the symbolism and symbolism of those tools of the medieval operative stonemason. So we've got the, the hammer or the common gavel, we've got the square, we've got compasses, and these were all the tools that were traditionally used by stonemasons, uh, builders of temples, cathedrals, any building, these were all the tools that, that were part of the trade. So to a handful of the tools, there's symbolic applications of them, what they can mean to a mason in terms of being able to improve oneself, to take oneself as a rough stone use these tools of the builder's trade and refine yourself to become a portion of a building, a, a useful part of a, a whole. And within masonry, within our ritual, the supreme being is referred to by the title of the great architect of the universe, which um, helps keep Masonic ritual um, uh, religion neutral. So you can be a member of any religion, you have an obligation to um, whoever you feel the great architect of the universe would be. But it's also it, it's also a very specific title to have. You could say, you know, creator, uh, designer, planner, but there is something a little bit more about being an architect of something because that involves a little bit more than just throwing things together and a little bit more than just having a plan. It's a plan, it's ideas, but it's also got some of the embellishments and extra properties that give architecture a little bit more um, of a form of art to be able to, to have some of these extra designs on them. And we talk a lot about King Solomon's Temple. It's the, the centerpiece for a lot of our ritual. And to kind of put King Solomon's Temple in perspective, the Parthenon in Greece it has Doric design columns. And so those were the Doric columns were most popular in the archaic period. So 750 to 480 BCE. And conventionally King Solomon's reign is around 970 to 931 BCE. So it was built in the mid 10th century BCE. So a couple hundred years before Doric columns became big. And you can see these two, these two columns, these pillars set up here are they they don't have any of the conventional um, designs of some of this classical architecture that we're gonna gonna discuss and you can see they aren't even really functional I mean they have a function but they're not holding anything up they're just there um, you know as non architectural purposes so it's always interesting when you see a an organization that traces itself to this this era of architecture and building talking about uh, architectural elements that weren't in existence around that time. So we'll get a little bit into that kind of near the end where I um, ruminate on what these sorts of things mean to Masons. So an order in architecture itself, this this is kind of the, the definition section where I'll go over um, a lot of vocabulary, more than I thought would be needed <laughs> for this. But it's several styles of classical or neoclassical architecture that are defined by the column and entablature, that's the horizontal, that are used as a, as a basic unit. So the column itself, it's got a base, the very bottom, and it's capital at the top. And so the 
the column supports the entablature, which is the upper horizontal of a building, and it's composed of an architrave, a frieze, and a cornice. And that's kind of where a lot of the buildings have the the variety is this um, the the top of the the capital. So that's what what distinguishes each one of these forms. And you can really kind of see as we go through what some of the the differences are. And neoclassical architecture itself. It's a revival of classical architecture during the 18th and early 19th centuries. So compared to classical revivalism, uh, which tended to basically just take this idea of columns and put them in buildings, it was um, concerned itself with the, the logic, which I thought was interesting because that's one of the, the um, liberal arts and sciences of this idea of, you know all of these rules, how can you apply them to buildings instead of just like, well, they put columns here, let's put a column here. It's kind of why um, these ideas, these um, principles were, were designed. So it's characterized by a grandeur of scale, simplicity of, of geometric forms, so it's not real crazy or ornamental. Um, the Greek or uh, especially Doric or Roman detail, and then a lot of columns and a preference for blank walls. And it's nice being in the DC area because you go down to DC and that's, you know, a large amount of these buildings, they've all got columns everywhere, blank walls, um, and there's a lot of different things that um, hopefully when you go there, you can point and say, look at that ionic column and people might be mildly impressed. And in terms of the time frame, so in by 1800, nearly all new British architecture reflected the neoclassical spirit. And within the United States, neoclassicism continued to flourish through the 19th century and that's a lot of that's because you have a younger country and so architects want to kind of give that that idea of um imperial rome of this of this timeless uh classic society when building all of these buildings so you'll see government buildings state capitals they all kind of use these these similar architectural designs to put everything kind of into a little bit of perspective as well in the 18th and 19th century you have the Age of Enlightenment, which was a big time when, um, you know, we kind of discussed it in the liberal arts and sciences, and even a little bit in the the virtues that this was when, um, kind of like in the Renaissance, when thinkers were looking back at some of these previous societies and seeing and and kind of revisiting some of their great works, and again adding a new emphasis onto it. So also around that time, you have late Baroque and classical music um, beginning, and Mozart, who was a mason, um, you know, was instrumental in changes of, in music, which is one of the seven liberal arts and sciences. You have um, the British colonizing everywhere, and with um, the beginning of Freemasonry in England, or at least the Grand Lodge in England, you get a lot of Grand Lodges springing up everywhere. You have the push for American independence in the in you know 17 1776. There was uh, Freemasonry pretty well involved with that, and then the beginning, possibly of when at least when the Grand Lodge of England was formed, and the spread of speculative masonry, which is this idea of using these architectural ideas, but we're not actually builders by trade. So for the dictionary kind of went over a few of these, but um, at the bottom of the column, we have the base, but there's usually this this flat stone. Um, well, at the bottom, what they're sitting on is called the styloblate. So that's just where where the column meets the, the pavement. And that's kind of what the, the ground is, what supports the columns. And some columns will have this uh, this plinth, which is gonna be your, your square block that the, the column sits on top of as part of the base. And then on top of the plinth, there'll be a couple other circular moldings. You can kind of see um, this little laser pointer is working um, on the Ionic and Corinthian near the base. Some of these um, moldings that that kind of helps to, to step up from this plinth up to the, the column itself. So we also have the shaft, which, you know, is the big part of, of the column. And it, a lot of the times it has this this fluting, this these vertical grooves as a design, and a lot of the times for um, you know the the engineering purposes, the base of the column is tapered 
um, is wider and it tapers up more narrowly to the top to be able to support um, this horizontal part of the building. On top of the shaft, you have the, the capital, which is the most, you know, we said earlier, it's the most um, distinguishing part of a column. And that's what really holds the weight of the horizontal. It's sitting on top of the, the capital. And then it also works as a transition of these this vertical line, this fluting, to be able to kind of break that up to have different portions of, of a building. So we mentioned earlier that there's five, there's five orders in architecture and three of them were invented by the Greeks and then the Romans uh, added two variants on that. So the Grecian orders, we have the Doric order. It's a slightly tapered column. So again, narrow at the top, wider at the bottom, but it's the most squat. And it says, the um, most of this was from the Encyclopedia Britannica. So it's four to eight lower diameters high. So instead of measuring just the height of it, it's it's a proportional measurement. So you have the width of the column and then you do four or eight of those and that's gonna be your your height. So that's kind of an interesting way of determining these, these proportions for these columns that if your column's gonna be tall, then the base is gonna have to be wide to be able to handle that. So there's no individual base. This actually does kind of show one, but it would rest right on the stylo base, so just right on the um, the stone or the concrete underneath it. So the shaft has 20 shallow flutes, so it's not as um, as pronounced as some of the other orders. And then the the capital, the top, just has a, a simple necking. So it's got this. Uh, a spreading convex echinus and a square abacus. So the abacus is, is this part right on the top. And then on top of that, you have the, the frieze, which has, um, it's called projecting triglyphs. So it's, it's these three units right here that are vertical bands and then plain sections called uh, metopes that a lot of the times they'd have a little car figure or a design or something in between these. And so the Roman versions, since a lot of this was happening around the same time uh, or borrowing from each other, some of the Roman versions of Doric columns have uh, smaller proportions. So they're a little bit smaller, narrower, and so they look lighter and more graceful than the Greek ones, which you know we said that they're the most squat of all the orders. So here's um, another quick, uh, another version of it. So you can see this narrow fluting on the shaft, um, this abacus, the echinus, and then uh, the cornice, the very top of it, the freeze section, which is where um, you have these uh, metopes panels that can be carved and designed on, the triglyph, and then the uh, architrave right here, which is kind of the functional part that, that sits on it. So a couple of examples in the DC area, you have um, the crypt in the US Capitol building. And looking into that, this is, this is in the basement or the lower level and all of these columns right here, you're, you know, I'm kind of used to seeing this idea of columns on the outside. So we have the Russell Senate office building, which has, it's you know, kind of hard to see, but there's two Senate buildings that were built and designed around the same time and they, they match and they all have these um, Doric columns on the outside. But this is kind of an example of it being functional because it's supporting the floor above in the, the Capitol and it got the name the crypt because there was discussion at one time of having George Washington's remains in here and they kind of adapted the design a little bit to be able to um to store George Washington's remains but then um you know he wanted to stay at Mount Vernon so, Vernon, so that's uh that's currently where he's at you can also see another example uh in the Supreme Court main hall and again, you can kind of see how this entire hallway is lined with these Doric columns. And, you know, looking into these and seeing what buildings have them, again, I don't know if you can go into the Senate office building, but it's one of those situations where living relatively close to DC, I've never been inside the Capitol or Supreme Court or seen inside any of these um, buildings. So it would be uh, pretty, pretty neat to try to take an architectural tour um, 
you know, once uh, once we're allowed outside. So moving on from Doric columns, you have ionic columns, which are pretty distinct. They have more flutes on the shaft. They're a bit easier to see. You have these these scrolls or volutes, and th this is kind of like the classic. If you know you see this on a column, you can say, oh, that's that's ionic. Nothing else really has that. It's this this plain scrolling idea. So the echinus itself is carved with an egg and dart motif, and I've got a, uh, a picture of that coming up. And the entire height, so column base capital, so the, this whole thing is nine lower diameters. So you can have a taller, slightly narrower column out of this. So the base of the column has these two convex moldings, so these two smaller rings separated by a, by a scotia in between here. And then the shaft, is eight lower diameters high. So again, you have this proportion knowing that this part of the base and this part of the capital is gonna add up to, to one lower diameter. And then on the entablature, this architrave right here, it's um, made up of three stepped fascia. So we got one, two, three steps. And then the frieze, this part right here that I was pointing at, it doesn't have that, that triglyph those three grooves and the the metope so this area was used a lot more for larger sculptures larger designs to be able to, to carry across an entire section of the top of a building so again um here's kind of a broken down section of it but this is what this um egg and dart motif that that goes in between these the the scrolls the volutes is so you've got your egg right here and and a dart, and this is a, a fairly common these days um, design. So uh, it's it's something that you will be able to see, kind of as its own on on molding. So it's an interesting design because it's not just it's a geometric pattern, but it's not just squares or angles or, or something like that. So examples of ionic columns, I mean, you can see from far away, you've got these these scrolls on them. So you've got the Jefferson Memorial, the U.S. Treasury Building, the Longworth. Longworth House office building and the old Senate chamber against this wall here, you have this this large row of ionic columns. Corinthian columns are, um, they're taller, so it, the whole thing is 10 diameters high, so it's again a taller and narrower one. And instead of having these, this scroll on top of it, you have uh, two staggered rolls of stylized acanthus leaves. So that's what, um, these are you've got these these leaves on them and then four scrolls on the top and they're kind of harder to see um, but they do have some of these scrolls and then the shaft itself has 24 sharp edge flutes so they're a little bit more pronounced these vertical lines within the uh, within the column and the acanthus is an interesting plant because it's commonly called bears breeches not sure how it got its name, but this is uh, this is the flower, which I thought actually looked a little bit more like these leaves than the leaves itself did. And it's something that I always find interesting when it shows up in other designs because you've got an old column here of this acanthus leaves, but then you also have um, an old design with the Buddha in the middle of it. So again, this is something that that throughout time traveling around the world this this idea is still in place of having these leaves showing up as an architectural motif and this one's interesting because it's a corinthian column it's got these scrolls but it also still has this this egg and dart design in the middle as well and learning about the composite column uh, sometimes it is kind of hard to tell the the difference between the two so the Corinthian columns, I believe this is also in the, the Senate, but uh, all of these columns at the top here have this uh, Corinthian design. And again, in the old Senate chamber, you have these Corinthian columns all along the back holding up this, this upper balcony. So they go all the way around the building. And it's interesting that you have these Corinthian columns here, and then this is where those um, ionic columns that we saw in the previous picture are at. So you've got a mix of Corinthian and ionic columns, which is kind of interesting to think about um, mixing these two designs, having them kind of uh, interspersed that way. Uh, there were a lot of variations on the Corinthian column, especially within the United States. So again, we have this hall, hall of columns in the US Capitol that's got um, 
the the Corinthian design, but there's also a variation that's got corn cobs. And when Thomas Jefferson was, um, you know, commissioning these designs, I believe it was uh, Latrobe, who was also a, a Freemason, who was designing a lot of these buildings. He made one with tobacco leaves for Thomas Jefferson. So these are tobacco leaves on on this column. So it's kind of interesting that um, you can use different regional plants as um, a, a top for for this column to put on the on the capital of this column, and then just have them all over the place, even you know inside buildings holding up stuff mixed with other um, column types. So we also have two Roman orders. We have the Tuscan columns, which is a Roman adaptation of the Doric column. So it's it's unfluted, it's got a plain base, um, simple Aquinas and Abacus, so there's nothing real fancy going up at the top here. Um, it's similar in proportion and profile to the Doric, but it's it's more plain. It doesn't have that fluting and the, the top is more plain. So it's seven diameters high. Again, it's it's a shorter one, um, almost more functional, being able to, to be squatter and to be able to hold up um, part of a building. So it is more solid because it's, it's a shorter one. It was a little harder to find Tuscan columns in the DC area, but the Arlington Memorial Amphitheater um, is ringed with uh, Tuscan columns. And you'll see Tuscan columns a lot um, at universities, uh, different buildings. Um, they were pretty common in the South among plantation owners who, you know, like when we were discussing the beginning of neo of neoclassical architecture in the United States, you also have these these plantation owners who also want to convey this idea of strength and authority, you know, while they're telling their slaves what to do. So they have their these impressive columns to, to kind of remind them of, of the Roman Empire and this, this great um, dynasty. Uh, then finally, we have composite columns. So it wasn't a separate order until the Renaissance, and it's a Roman variation on the Corinthian, and it's composed of the Ionic volutes, so these scrolls, on top of the Corinthian acanth acanthus leaf. And again, it's it's 10 diameters high, so the same height as the Corinthian, but also the the Corinthian still has some of these these scrolls. So if you look, this is the Corinthian version, this is the composite. So it's pretty, uh, you know, doesn't look like there's a whole lot of variation to me, um, but you know, I, I guess there is one. So uh, St Paul's Cathedral in London has uh, the composite design. Although, looking closely at this one, you know, the scrolls still seem like they, they match this. Um, so that's probably a fault of Google image search. But also the treasury at Petra in Jordan, which was built in the first century AD, um, it said that those were also composite columns. And, um, you know, this is something, this is, uh, it's actually a mausoleum. It's not a treasury that was carved out of uh, the stone wall in Jordan. And it was called the treasury because uh, the local Bedouins thought that there was treasure stored in there, which might have been because it was a mausoleum. But so that's why it was called the treasury uh, because people thought that there was treasure there. So um, interesting little thing I picked up about that doing doing this uh, research. So the orders kind of advanced the Doric and Ionic. They happen kind of around the same time on opposite shores of the Aegean Sea, so here and here. So you've got Doric starting on the the Greek mainland, and then the Ionic on the um, eastern cities of Asia Minor, and that's um, the volutes, the scrolls on on the top of the Ionic columns. That's adapted from uh, Phoenician and Egyptian capital design. So some of the um, not sure why they made it from Asia Minor up there, but that's um, kind of where that, that design came from. So then um, the Greeks and the Romans uh, regarded Corinthian columns as just a variant. You can use it for the Ionic as well because essentially the bottom's the same, you just have variations on the, the top and the, the capital. Something interesting that I found was another Roman innovation was the superimposed order. So we saw in the old Senate hall both a mix of Corinthian and Ionic columns. And I was kind of wondering, 
is that something where it's just like um, someone's looking at a book of old designs and says, yeah, I want that one, that one, that one, but they don't necessarily sync together. But the Roman innovation was you could have different columns, different column types on different stories of a building. So you'd have different orders based on the floor of the building. You'd have the heaviest, the most squattest, so your Tuscan, your Dora columns on the bottom floor, Ionic in the middle, and then Corinthian or composite on the, the top level of the building. So it's interesting kind of seeing um, the this idea of different columns, different orders on, on each subsequent floor. And to kind of tie all that together, I guess they had super col columns which spanned the entire bu building. Um, so, but to, to keep it a little bit shorter, I just focused on, um, I tried to focus on the DC area for some of the, the architecture, but the, you know, it's something where if you're traveling, you know, everybody go, when they're in Greece or, or Italy, they go see the old, uh, the old, the Colosseum, the, the old temples in Greece. So, you know, knowing kind of a little bit about that architecture and that, that history when they were created is, is something useful to, to be able to have. So again, why are why are columns designed by ancient Greeks and Romans important to Masons who have an organization that uh, modernized in England in the 1800s and uses metaphors of building King Solomon's temple? You know it it kind of feels like there's there's a bit of a gap there and for the importance to masonry it's it's you see it everywhere in masonry you have lodges um within maryland you have lodges all over the place named after uh these column types there's corinthian lodge and towson um they're borrowing somebody else's temple so they just have these uh these doric co columns out front we've got ionic lodge in reisterstown they've got ionic columns um composite lodge um, they're borrowing uh, another lodge's building, I believe. Um, it's kind of harder to find some of the history of that. But these are also a lot of the times lodges will will merge. So I imagine there's also a uh, Tuscan or and Doric lodge uh, of Maryland Lodge Antiquity. So one of these days I'll have to to look that up and and add it into here as well. Um, within Silver Spring Lodge, we're working on replacing the columns that we have uh, on our porch. And so we've got our nice uh, Doric columns right here. So you can kind of see, um, you know, they're something that shows up everywhere within within buildings and within masonry. I also found out that there was something called the Solomonic column, and this is a lot of words going on here, but it's this idea of a, a spiral, like a twisted column. And it's not really part of a classical order it could have any sort of top on it, so it could be Doric or Ionic, um, but it was a more Eastern motif, so uh, the Byzantine architecture, architecture so uh, Turkey, old Roman era, era um, kind of used a lot of that. And part of the story is that in the fourth century, Constantine the Great, he brought a set of columns to Rome for the original Basilica of St. Peter. And there's a painting depicting that um, that Raphael painted. And so according to the tradition, the columns came from the Temple of Solomon. Um, you know, a, again, there's inconsistency with dates for these things. Solomon's Temple was the first one, which was destroyed in 583. The second one was destroyed in 70 CE. So the columns are actually now considered to have been made in the second century, but that's why they're called Solomonic columns because they were, allegedly from the Temple of Solomon. And it was re revived in Baroque architecture, which is more dynamic, more ornamental than um, the kind of like plain or um, functional Greek architecture. So um, you'll see it kind of in more fancy kind of kind of buildings, but it's interesting that, uh, that this uh, Solom Solomonic uh, column did not pick up that strongly in masonry. So, you know, we talked, about in in our lectures things like the seven liberal arts and sciences the cardinal and theological virtues and what the and the orders of architecture and what these all kind of have in common is that they were greek and roman ideas that kind of picked up again in the renaissance 
and then again in the Age of Enlightenment. And the idea of architecture, of using columns and horizontals to, to build a covering, to have a building or um, shelter, it's, you know, a an idea that you see throughout the world, throughout all ages. So it's, again, a basic human idea, and it's the foundation of, of architecture where it kind of first started. So we have this idea of basic architecture with columns and horizontals, being able to create shelter, taking these architectural tools as, as symbols, uh, moving the scene to King Solomon's temple, and uh, referring to supreme architect of the universe. So it's it, it's a pretty decent line on how um, architecture and these, these basic tools uh, came into play within masonry. But how these Age of Enlightenment thoughts of like seven liberal arts and sciences, carnal virtues, classical architecture, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a gap between, you know, talking about the supreme architect of the universe and symbolism behind a gavel or a square or a compass. And what those are more towards is this idea of the architecture as, as symbolism and how on this side, we've got the tools as symbols and all these different schools of thought. And then on the other side, we've got King Solomon's temple and a devotion to God, to a deity. and the way they can kind of be tied together is this idea of improving the soul and improving the mind. So we've got architecture tools as symbols to be able to improve our, our souls, to make ourselves better people, to, clean, to, to square this rough stone, and to improve our minds, again, so we can learn, we can become functional members of an organization, of a society, of a group, and to be able to teach others how to um, apply these symbols. So, you know, as Masons, we improve our minds with, with education, which with learning about some of these ideas of the liberal arts and sciences, cardinal virtues, theological virtues, classical architecture, all of these um, Greek and Roman ideas that experienced resurgence in the Renaissance and the Age of Enlightenment, and we use those to improve our minds. We have the aid of the symbols of the architectural tools, and we use those to improve ourselves to become better, uh, better people to be able to make our way to the supreme architect of the universe to fit in with with the plan to be useful people to be and then hopefully our souls when you know we die go into the to the universe and and kind of become one with everything so um it's kind of um a, a loftier version but that's kind of what i've been getting um at from some of these uh lectures that i've done of we have these sections of our ritual of our lectures where we talk about these things and part of it's just rattling off a list. There might be a little bit of a description behind them, but really tying it in um, to symbolic masonry, to what the symbols mean, to um, why we would talk about Greek architecture and then what that actually entails, what that means in improving ourselves to become one with the supreme architect of the universe. Um, and we talk about the architectural tools and, and these ideas a lot in the second degree. Um, we have this idea that Freemasonry is a system of morality, veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. And you have the first degree, which is about purification, about you know removing all of the distractions, all of the uh, external vices. That's where the, the virtues come in. And the second degree is about illumination. It's about education. It's about preparing yourself and learning, applying these these tools that you learn. So in the third degree, you're you're able to be to to undergo a transformation. So that's kind of where um, the second degree has a lot of education built into it. A lot of different things that that you can learn about. So takeaways from all of this that. You know, orders of architecture, they're, they're varied, 
um, but it's just a beginning step to admiring a part of a building, you can now look at the top of a column and say, okay, I know what that is. And then you know the the different shaft of a column, the, the flutes on it, the bases of it. Uh, and then stepping back from that, you've got the whole building you can look at. And again, just like with, with King Solomon's Temple, you can marvel at an entire human endeavor of building this this massive building. And again, we use this Masonic education to improve our minds using these classical ideals that, that experience this, this resurgence during enlightenment and, um, and uh, the Renaissance. So uh, we'll do some questions. Um, that kind of concludes the, the formal part of the presentation. But um, if you have any questions, if you want to, to use these videos or lectures or have me yammer at your lodge um shoot us an email at, at education silverspring 215.org uh we're on youtube so this is our um channel right here it takes us uh, a thousand people to like our videos before we can change this to um silver spring lodge so it might be faster to just change our lodge name to to this